Jen Mallon and welcome to Come Home. If you were a regular viewer of Homekeepers that was hosted by my very special friend, Arthleen Rippey for many, many decades, then you are no stranger to my guests today. Jean and Carol Kent have an incredible story. What to do when the unthinkable happens? How do you lay your Isaac on the altar? It's easy to read stories in the Bible, but what about those moments that you have to apply them to your current life situation to get in and really unpack the word and ask the Holy Spirit to make it so unique, so personal, and so real to you? Today, we are going to talk about the story of their son and how they have walked out the last 23 years taking something that the enemy meant for bad and inviting the redemptive power of the Holy Spirit and seeing God turn it toward his good. I love that so many of my guests are not sitting on an ivory tower and saying we have the victory, but they're saying we are still walking out a journey. I love their faith story. I love the perseverance. And I know many of you, according to Galatians 6, 9, it says, don't grow weary in well-doing. Do not grow weary of planting good seeds in good soil, because if you don't give up, if you don't faint, then you will reap. In other words, you will get on the other side of it and you will see the goodness of God in the land of the living. You know, this earth is not our home. And so much that happens is not our choosing or our liking. But when we are men of the word and women of the word, we go there and that is where we get a wealth of wisdom, revelation, and it helps us walk out this experience, this thing called life. Listen, Christianity is messy. Our testimonies are messy. There's so much hurt and brokenness, woundedness and pain. And yet in this wonderful book, when I lay my Isaac down, there's talk of perseverance, joy, community, so many things that are so important. And so before we go into the living room and sit down and hear this story, let's go very quickly to a life hack. One thing that I do know I have no problem doing is succulents. So we've got this centerpiece. You can get these troughs really anywhere. Get succulents and just fill them. I leave this out year round. You don't have to ever touch it again. It doesn't die. You don't have to water it and it makes a perfect long, low centerpiece for a table. So that's what I would recommend if you don't have any green thumb. One of the things that we planted when we moved here, because I love them and they last a long time and they fill a lot in a vase, is hydrangeas. So the front of our house is all the white hydrangeas and the back is blue and purple and things like that. So what I've done is I found a box like this, just a plain old box, and I've taken three mason jars. You can see it here, three mason jars. And I've actually taken a rubber band and tied all the hydrangeas. Otherwise, they kind of just fall out. They're so top heavy. And just stuffed them so you don't see any empty space. It's just hydrangeas. Super easy. Anybody can do it. Here's another thing I love. So next to hydrangea, I love peonies. I think peonies are my favorite flower. The problem with peonies is their season is so short. So I grab them whenever I can. I love greens. So go all over your yard, your property, and just pick greens. Pick ferns, pick, I mean, bushes, and then just literally, you don't even need that many flowers. And it's super easy, N nothing difficult. Here's some more peonies. I did the same thing that I did here. I took a whole bunch of peonies, cut the bottom, and tied a big rubber band around them so that they wouldn't lop over. And again, made them so tight that it was kind of a simple ball. And this one's just much more elegant for, you know, an afternoon tea or just on your coffee table. The last thing, and I think this is one of my favorites, I have several very large vases, and particularly for our barn. And different times of year, I do different things. So in the fall, I love to get twigs with berries, and I'll stick seven big berry twigs in it, and that's it. And it's just a cool backdrop for anything. 
Right now, hydrangea are in, so I stick just long stems of hydrangea. I also have catmint that I have just cut, and it just kind of gives a little bit of a pop and just stick little sprigs of purple throughout it. And it's super easy, not complicated. And uh, like I said, if I can do it, then anybody can do it. And that's it. So I really recommend that you try to figure out ways to pull the outside in. Don't be afraid of anything. I'm telling you, if I can do this, anyone can. Listen, today I'm thrilled about my guest, what she has walked through, what she has overcome, what she and her husband have created as a legacy and as a ministry of reconciliation to give back and help other people that are in a similar situation. And she's no stranger to this network or to many Christian outlets, and that is Carol Kent. Thank you so much for thank, being here. Thank you, Jen. It is such an honor to be on the air with you. Well, I know you are very busy and in high demand, and so I appreciate you making time to be here today. Well, thank you for the opportunity. So for those, and I know there's probably very few uh, that are not aware of the events that transpired 23 years ago involving uh, the apple of your eye, your one and only child. Yes. Would you just kind of tell us a little bit, give us that mm -hmm. history? Well, I got married to Jean Kent right <laughs> after I graduated from college. We had no money, but lots of love. And probably a whole lot of viewers can identify with that. <laughs> yes. And uh, we raised an only child who was really a joy to be around. He came to know Jesus early. He set his sights on getting into the U.S. Naval Academy and finally received that appointment. And we were there in May of 1997 when on national television, all of those midshipmen tossed those hats in the Aww. air and we celebrated our young son's accomplishments. Uh, from there, he went to Orlando, Florida, and he was involved in nuclear engineering school. So he was very smart. Oh, well, I, I like to think uh, so. I think so. He takes after my husband. <laughs> but uh, and, you and, and you and Jean have been married how long? We have been married 53 years. <gasps> Isn't that shocking? <sighs> Yay! <laughs> yes, yes. That's awesome. It is a miracle. Yes, that but is special. I am very grateful for him. But uh, Jason joined a Bible study in a large church in Orlando and fell madly in love. And uh, April, his uh, soon-to-be wife, had been previously married and had two little girls, six-year-old Chelsea and three-year-old Hannah. Mm -hmm. And uh, we found out that they were marrying very quickly because Jason's orders had changed. And uh, we asked them if they would wait and be married three weeks later in our then hometown of Port Huron, Michigan, and they agreed. So a week and a half later, these three beautiful women came into our lives and it did not take me long to love April. She had been married at the age of 16 to a man 10 years her senior. She had known a lot of abuse and there were also multiple allegations of abuse involving the little girls. And we had a beautiful wedding on a picture perfect day and if you could have seen Jason in his navy whites and April in her dress from a oh. retail shop, you would have thought they looked like they're living in a story that should end, and they lived happily ever after. But there were issues in that first year involving the biological father. He had only been given supervised visitation. He had been behaving very well, and it appeared a judge was going to give him unsupervised visitation. And Jason got his first orders outside of the continental USA, and he was going to Hawaii, and that would mean six-week visits with the little girls alone with their father, and Jason did not trust him. And Jen, in retrospect, we began to see our son unravel mentally, emotionally, and spiritually as his fears for the girls increased. Yeah. I had been in ministry for several years as a Christian author and public speaker for retreats and conferences. We came home on a Sunday night from a ministry trip, fell asleep, and at 12.30 a.m., the phone rang. And I just remember looking at my husband and seeing this look of shock and horror come over his face. And he, he said, Carol, Jason has just been arrested for the murder of his wife's first husband. He's in the jail in Orlando. 
Well, Jen, I had never been in shock before. I had nausea sweep over me. My legs wouldn't hold my weight. I literally crawled my way to my office, still on the floor. I grabbed a phone, got a number for the Orlando jail. And when I finally got a hold of someone and asked about my boy, a, a voice on the other end of the line said, lady, we ain't got nobody by that name, Jason Ken, in here. Lady, your son ain't here. And Jen, I know we've all had that moment where we think we're in a dream. Yeah, maybe it didn't happen. Yes, this is a horrible nightmare. I will soon wake up mm -hmm. and everything will be okay. But as hour followed hour, the facts of the case were confirmed. Our son had pulled a trigger in a public parking lot and a man had died. We went through two and a half years and seven postponements of Jason's trial. And he was eventually convicted to first with first degree murder and life without the possibility of parole. He had just turned 25 years old, oh. 10 days before the horrible, heinous crime. And uh, our, our hearts were shattered. Yeah. I cannot even begin to tell you the tears that flooded this mama and the hopelessness of wondering, Lord, I've lived my whole life for you. Why did you let this bad thing happen? Yeah. And I'm just guessing somebody out there feels the same. Yeah, that's real. Yeah. And you you were a PK. You had, you had served the Lord your whole life. I'm the oldest of six preacher's kids. That oh. means I'm a little perfectionistic and bossy. I Not understand. necessarily a good trait. <laughs> But I was used to being in charge, and suddenly I felt like I couldn't even keep two thoughts in my head at yeah. the same time. I felt like my world was crumbling. So from that tragedy, which you can never prepare for, yeah. there's just nothing. You can, you can think through scenarios. You can, you know, when you're pregnant, you hold your baby. What if, what if? But you can never prepare for that type of situation. So how did, when I lay my Isaac down, become birth? How, mm. how was that birth? Because, and, and let me just uh, say this, that um, when I lay my Isaac down, it's a powerful book, not just for those that are in crisis, but just how to surrender, how to surrender mm -hmm. when things don't go your way. Because you can read the Bible story yes. when I lay my Isaac down, yes. but then when when you have to do it, how? But how, how was this birth? When did God say, pick up your pen mm. and begin to write and begin to heal? Well, it certainly took a few years. Yeah. And I am, would be the first to say, allow yourself to, to mourn, to grieve. We think of David just flat on the floor, yeah. pouring out his heart before the Lord. And I, I went through that horrible grieving time. Our son was accosted by 10 inmates when he was in jail during the first couple of weeks and his two front teeth were broken off. He had a cut in his ear. He, uh, when I saw him the first time, his eyes were fully bloodshot. And I just remember uh, hearing him slowly move because he had on ankle cuffs with a chain between his legs and he had on handcuffs attached to a waist chain. And I was used to seeing him in naval uniforms and suddenly my son was a maximum security inmate. And I remember as he turned the bend, I knew there would be plexiglass between us. I knew an officer would be listening to everything we said, but for several moments, we couldn't speak. We just wept, yeah. a mom and her boy, knowing something had happened that could never be undone. Yeah. And I finally was able to get my voice and I just said, Jason Paul Kent, there is nothing Thing you could ever do that would stop my unconditional love for you, son. Your dad and I are here for you. Now, Jason, I believe, was so intent on protecting his girls yeah. that he had come to the place, and he would tell you this today, of making an idol out of his own, of his own ability to protect those girls. Yeah. He said, I should have taught them to dial 911. I should have taught them to scream and yell and yeah. run. But instead, I took matters into my own hands, and I did the worst thing possible, not only for the family of the deceased and the victim, but for my own family. And I, I began to just be so overwhelmed with grief when that visit was over like that. 
And I went out to the parking lot, Jen, and I sat there and I was crying so hard I, I couldn't drive away. And all of a sudden my mind went back to Genesis 22, where Abraham was asked to sacrifice his only son on an altar. And I quickly need to say my son was no Isaac. Isaac had done nothing wrong to merit the sacrifice. My son had taken the life of a human being. Yeah. And our hearts grieve for any of you out there who have been victims of violent crime. There's pain on both sides of every crime, and it is so intense, and our hearts grieve for you. But the thing that I knew is that the Bible said Abraham got up early the next morning to make the trip to Mount Moriah. It was a three-day journey. I would have waited until at least noon, hoping God would change his exactly. mind. Exactly. After a nice yes. cup of coffee. And uh, <laughs> let's have a do-over plan here. This is not working for me. Right, right. And uh, I, I realized that when they got there, and you just see young Isaac saying, Dad, we have the wood, we have the fire, but where is the lamb? And it says that Abraham bound his son and laid him on the altar. And I love studying the meanings of Bible words. Yeah. And the, the verb form for laying him on the altar was actually a lifting up. In other words, it was a supreme act of high worship <sighs> for Abraham to lay his Isaac down. And I really believe this, the seed work for this book that became When I Lay My Isaac Down was born that day in a jailhouse parking lot <laughs> because I needed to relinquish what I could not control to the God who loved my child even more than I did, which is sometimes overwhelming to me. So we had a lot of principles to learn. Yeah. And the principle of the fact that even when you are at your lowest, that that sometimes is your best place to be yeah. because then you're willing to say, God, I am so broken. I need yeah. help. And I'm a do-it-yourself girl. Yeah. You know, my, my multitasking was somehow immobilized. And all of a sudden, I was feeling, I just can't even, I can't even function. I would say, breathe, do the oh. next thing. But we came to that place of realizing that we needed to practice the principle of relinquishment, trusting God with what we could not fix and what we could not control. Wow. That is a mouthful. Mm. That is a heartful. That is, we spend our whole life, uh, and many, Carol, many believers never learn how to lay something down. They never learn the mm. necessity of relinquishment yes. Yes. and surrender, and God is yours. Yes especially a mother. There's a mm -hmm. unique dynamic between mother and child yes. uh, when we carry them and birth them and nurse them and raise them. And then what do you mean? Lay them down. Uh, how do you do that? Or we say, Lord, I give him to you right now. And the next day we say, I'm taking I him take back. Him back. <laughs> and so I've learned that relinquishment is an ongoing daily yeah. experience when we live in a hard place. And a lot of people have hard stories. Yeah. And there may be a lot of people watching us today who don't have an incarcerated child, but they, they may be struggling with infertility or they've gotten a, a horrific diagnosis from the doctor or the, the spouse that promised to love them forever betrayed them and left them for somebody else. We all have these Isaacs that yeah. represent situations or people we need to give to the Lord and say, God, would you be in charge of this situation? Because I can't do it anymore. Yeah. I, I cannot do it. And I, I trust you. And I know you love me, even if in this lifetime, I can't figure out why you have allowed me to struggle like this. Yeah. And we can get so caught up asking the Lord the wrong question. Mm -hmm. We can We can ruminate and spin and ask and I think that your your book, and by the way, uh, I encourage everyone to get the updated and expanded version of this book because there's almost an additional 100 pages from the original. And in that, you do the study questions and the prayers and the references and um, you empower so much. I, I, I love that you, you did that. But in this, in this, you start to outline that process of continually relinquishing. Mm -hmm. It's not a one-time thing. No, it is not. And, and I, I just want to say too, Jen, 
that God never wastes our sorrow. Mm -mm. When we begin making hope-filled choices yeah. based on biblical truth, there is a new kind of joy. Yeah. And there is uh, something that helps us to, to choose life instead of a kind of emotional death in the middle of what we think we cannot bear. We find splashes of joy yeah. in the middle of, of the circumstances. And one of the joys that my husband, Gene, and I are thanking the Lord for is that Jason is living for the Lord yeah. behind the razor wire. Yeah. And I call him my missionary on the inside. After he confessed his sin and repented of what he had done, uh, he began looking around to see how he could help. We found ourselves standing in these two hour long lines waiting to get through the intake process at a maximum security prison. And you meet a lot of families. And so we launched a nonprofit organization called speakupforhope.org. And we minister to inmates and their families through the nonprofit. And so it's a joy for Jean and me to sit with Jason and to brainstorm about what are the needs. Yeah. And Florida prisons are not air conditioned. And it gets up to over 100 degrees in those cell areas. And so our organization started buying fans for some of the living quarters. And Jason said, if I sit just right on my bed and lean <laughs> over, I can feel that breeze coming mm. around. And we've bought, bought Bible studies. He's taken over 800 inmates through Dave Ramsey's Financial Peace oh, University course. And I watch him as he's mentoring men. And this, this blessed me so much. Last spring, I was invited to speak at another prison, not the one where our son is, but a different prison in Florida. And I got there and I shared my story. And then the chaplain said to, to the inmates who were in the audience, uh, uh, fellas, do you have any questions for Mrs. Kent? And one by one, these men started standing up. Unbeknownst to me, several of them had been incarcerated with Jason in other prisons in the state oh, because wow. inmates get moved around. All the time. So one of them stood up and said, Mrs. Kent, your son led me to Jesus. Oh. Another one stood up and said, I, I don't have any anybody who puts money into my account anymore because after five years, most inmates are forgotten if yeah. they're lifers. Yeah. And he said, your son shared snacks with me his commissary, and he cares about people. And then a young man said, your son was my exercise and workout <laughs> buddy, and he got me in shape again. Wow. And then finally this young man stood up and he said through tears, Mrs. Kent, your son is famous throughout central oh. Florida in the prisons here because he cares about us. He cares about the Lord. He shares Jesus with us, and he shares his resources with us. Ma'am, you can be very proud oh. of your boy. <laughs> so in the middle of my tears, I was just saying, thank you, Lord. And in the middle of this lifelong journey, because in, in Florida, life is the rest of your life until you die. They call it a toe tag sentence because you won't leave a prison until you're dead on a slab with a tag on your toe. There's no early out for good behavior, no parole. And so we realize that the best we can do while we pray for a miracle yes. is to, to supply Jason with the resources he needs to serve Jesus on the inside. You know, we don't get to choose our stories. No. We don't get to choose our testimonies. We just get to respond yeah. and react. And you, so just those stories from those other yeah. prisoners, inmates, fruit of your labor, fruit of your prayer, seeing the goodness of God in the land of the living. And, and, and so there is beauty for ashes. Carol, we, we, um, we're kind of getting to the end and I just want to release you to minister. I know that there's so much in you. We could have gone mm -hmm. through chapters. I love the chapter on perseverance. I love the chapter on joy. I love, um, <laughs> I love the, the chapter on community and body life. There's so much in here. I encourage everyone to get it, but I do want to give you an opportunity just to minister to those that are watching that need that hope. And, and can't imagine having joy in, in certain circumstances. I would love to do okay. that. Thank you. Friends, thank you for tuning in today. I want you to know if you are in a hard place, one of the things I want to encourage you to do is to be honest with God and other people about your journey. 
I remember one of the women in my Bible study came up to me after I had told the honest truth about what our journey was. She said, Carol, I used to think you were perfect, but now I think we could be friends. And then what happens as we share our stories is that other people feel comfortable saying, let me tell you what happened to me. And we begin not only listening to each other, but praying for each other and supporting each other. And then the next thing that's so important is to start a gratitude list. I remember being at the prison one weekend and I, I said, Jason, how do you hold on to hope in the middle of a life sentence? He said, Mom, I, I have a gratitude list. Every time that cloud of depression begins to come over me, I get out this piece of paper and I write down everything I have to be thankful for. I am thankful. I have two parents who will be my advocates for as long as I live. The average number of years a lifer like me even gets visits is five years and nobody comes anymore. And then he paused and he said, I am thankful on a compound that houses up to 1,600 men, I can be a missionary in a very <laughs> dark place. And I want you to choose thankfulness. And then as you begin to say, Lord, what can I do with what's happened? Choose purposeful action. Try to, to look around and find one person who needs help worse than you do and with whatever resources you have, reach out to that person. We called the people who reached out to us our stretcher bearers. They carried us when we could not carry ourselves. And even if you don't have money, you can offer services that bless others. And then hold on to hope and don't fear, the Bible says. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Turn your fear into faith. Amen. Amen. And I just encourage all of you, uh, go to carolkent.org, support Speak Up for Hope. There's so much that can be done. There's over 2 million prisoners in the state of Florida and in your state, wherever you're watching, and we can be light. We can come in and help. That is the purpose of this program. It is the purpose of us walking with the Lord. And so, Carol, thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you for watching. We're gonna have Carol and Jean back soon and talk about some of the other ministries and missions and movements that they're involved in. I'm Jen Mallon, and I'm so blessed that you joined us today. Come home. Mm -hmm.